who has mentored me from afar and probably does not realize that he has. Uh, but I thank God for his and Sister Rhonda's ministry. I know Sister Rhonda's father, Brother Lawson, who today is his birthday and he turned 83. And so they'll be leaving here this evening to go and celebrate with him. But their whole family has been a blessing to Taylor and myself. And um, I'll go off my notes for just a minute, but they'll never realize how much they encouraged us just from their Facebook posts, their Facebook comments, and the fact that a state overseer knows us by name is just, you know, it's up here for me. It makes my head get a little bigger, uh, but it's big enough as it is, so God help us in that arena. But I wanted to introduce our guest this morning, Bishop Tim Brown, and uh, as I was preparing this, I thought I just want to read exactly what he put on their state website because I think this totally uh, defines him. When asked to describe his ministry, Bishop Brown responded that his desire is to be an encourager. He is a positive and inspirational motivator that carries the love of people close to his heart, and that's very true. He leads with a visionary mindset, and he is, he is a model of what it means to love God and love people and serve God and serve people. His philosophy is to give more than he takes, and he is a pastor at heart, and he leads with that intentionally. And I can honestly say I've been a recipient of that. At, in 2018, him and his wife Rhonda were assigned to serve as the administrative bishop of Florida, Tampa, and they have just been reassigned there at our General Assembly this past July. But he's also served in several, several other capacities as administrative bishop, including the state of Texas, Missouri, and the Rocky Mountain region. He has served on the Alabama Executive Offices as State Ministries Coordinator, and he has served as pastor for 20 plus years in Alabama and Tennessee. And he pastored several di dynamic and innovative churches, including Sherwood Church of God, which is now the healing place, which is our home church. So these are home people once again. Uh, Brother Brown presently serves as the board chairman for the Heart of Florida Youth Ranch. Previously, he has served as the chairman for the International Discipleship Board and as a member of the Church of God Publications Board. While pastoring in Tennessee, he served on the state council and the Youth Discipleship Board. Additionally, he has served on the state council in Alabama. Furthermore, he served as the volunteer trainer for chaplains for Jefferson County, Alabama. He has served as chaplain for Knox County, Tennessee, the city of Knoxville, and a chaplain for the State Highway Patrol in Colorado. Bishop Brown attended West Coast Bible College, Lee University, and the Church of God Theological Seminary. And at this past General Assembly, he was voted to the Council of 18. Him and his wife, Rhonda, have two sons, Brock and Brandon, and his wife, Angel, and one grandson, and I'm going to hope I say this right, Reese? Reese, thank God I did it right. Thank God for that. So we are blessed today to have Brother Brown and his wife Rhonda. So make them feel welcome this morning as he gets prepared to bring the word. Good morning. This is an exciting place. Would you not agree? Yes. I'm not going to tell you where, but... A short while back, I was invited to speak at a church. It was as dry as cracker juice. I'm telling you, nobody smiled. When I came in, no one said, hello, we're glad you're here. It was dead, twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Horrible experience. I went through that service. We went out to eat lunch at a restaurant. Pastor, at the restaurant, everybody was smiling. Come on in. We've got a seat for you. Somebody had a birthday and they celebrated the birthday. There was singing and rejoicing it was absolutely incredible. I got in my automobile to head home and I thought, now I have been to church. I have been to the restaurant. Neither place offered membership. But if they had, I would have joined the restaurant. <laughs> I think the Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. I think the word that tells us a merry heart does good like a medicine. So when I pulled onto this property, 
Not only was I greeted by pastor, I mean, you can't help but love this guy <laughs> and his precious spouse. I felt like I'm welcome here. Yeah. I came in and some of you, if you don't care about us being here, you're the biggest hypocrites I've ever met. <laughs> Because everybody has greeted us with warmth and welcome and a smile. And just the atmosphere in this place says, we are here joyful in the Lord to celebrate the good things of God. That's why I said this is an exciting place. Would you not agree? Amen. Amen. You already know this. You know this, but you are blessed with tremendous pastors. Amen. Now, I'm not just saying that. Amen. You are blessed with incredible leadership. And I say thank God for that. Amen. Pastor, I'm so proud of you. Your vision, your heart, and uh, your leadership is exemplary. I say that from the deep places in my heart. And you know, being a pastor is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, I'm invited to do a lot of places I go, celebrations, and when you pay off a debt, that's really something to celebrate, those kinds of days. And uh, sometimes I go in to pastor appreciation days, and uh, we celebrate the pastor, and it's a joyful time. I pastored almost 25 years, I'll be honest with you, Pastor. I always felt awkward on Pastor Appreciation Day. You don't know how to act. You, if you're not smiling, people think they don't even appreciate what we're doing for them. If you smile too much, they think, you know, he's enjoying this a little too much. So you don't know how to act. When I was pastoring in Knoxville, Tennessee, one Pastor Appreciation Day, they had some of the departments that were saying things about the pastor. We had a lady. Her name was Mary Ellen Robinson. She was about 75 years of age, single, and she was a part of our singles ministry. Now, I really think she was looking for somebody, to be honest with you. That's the only reason she went to our singles ministry. But they chose her on Pastor Appreciation Day to stand up and honor the pastor. And Mary Ellen got up and she said, now I'm going to say it like she did, Pastor, we love you. She said, you know, on a scale of one to ten, you're a one. <laughs> My associate bumped me and said, I think you're at least a three or a four. <laughs> But you never know how to act on days like those kinds of days. But you got a great pastor. Amen. And his spouse Amen. stands beside him. Thank you for what you do in the ministry. We honor you. And I'm honored to be here. And I, I need to say this. Seated right here is my wife of 44 years. I, I tell you what. I told her, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. You give me an hour to pay. Rhonda is an incredible woman of God. She's probably spoken in 38 or 39 different women's conferences across the nation. Uh, a real Christian. And I'm blessed any time that she's able to travel with me. And uh, we're going to go up later on this afternoon, the Lord willing, and celebrate her dad. 83 years of living and loving the Lord. Yes. We called him and sang to him this morning. And um, I, I look around. See, here's the tough thing about doing what I'm doing today. You kind of come in, you got one shot. I'm a people person, so I love to fellowship. You know, to fellowship, you got to have more than one fella in the ship. <laughs> And I, I just love people, and I want to visit with you, but I know I need to get into the Word because I don't want you to get through before I do. Some of you will get the going home look in your eye. I'm not talking about going home to glory either. 
But I look around those connected with the Bristow family that are here, that are dear friends of ours, and uh, I just feel like I'm among family. And where we stayed last night, Deborah, I think that's you right there on the third or fourth row. You were absolutely amazing. Thank you for your care. Bless you. I hope you get a front seat in heaven. That's right. Me too. Amen. But uh, I, I need to move on. Do you have your Bibles? Do you have your smartphone? Your iPad? That device to be able to follow along. I'm going to look in Mark chapter 5. And I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open if you would. I want to talk right out of my heart on the subject, it's not all over yet. It's not all over yet. Now, I'm going to wait to read some of this because... For the sake of time, I want to kind of get into the flow of what the Lord wants to speak to us today. Now, I'm not trying to be sensational. I'm not trying to be one that would try to play on anybody's emotions. But I really stand here today. I'm not sharing with you a sermon that I've preached all over Florida the last four years. I've not preached this in Florida. I feel like the Lord gave me a word for today for all of us. In fact, in the room, Rhonda and I were sharing out of this passage. And I couldn't help but weep this morning before arriving here, sensing what I sense in my spirit the Lord wants to do. I feel like I have a red hot word from the Holy Spirit. For us in this place today. I mean that with everything within me. When we look at the setting here, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see it's a time of stress. It is a time of anxiety. It is a time of fatigue for a man and his family. Because for some time now, they have been dealing with a 12-year-old girl who has been involved with dreaded disease. In fact, at this particular point, the doctors have given up hope. And they have told this man, Jairus, who was a man of intellect and potential and promise and power and prestige, they have told him, your daughter, 12 years old, is going to die. She is in the final stages of this terminal disease. And Jairus, there is nothing that we can do, and there is nothing that you can do about it. I don't know how it happened, but some way, somewhere, somehow... Jairus had heard about this man Jesus. This man Jesus, who was doing what doctors could not do. This man Jesus, who was walking into sick rooms and causing those that were sick to be healed. This man Jesus, who was causing those with blind eyes to be able to see. And those with lame limbs to be restored and made whole. And those who were deaf were able to hear the birds sing. And were able to hear the voices, maybe for the first time, from their loved ones. This man, Jesus. And all of a sudden, something burst in the heart of Jairus as he thought... If I can just find this man, Jesus, if I can just go to wherever he is and find him and talk with him and get him to come to my home, and if he'll just come to my house and simply lay his hands on my little girl, 
She will be healed and she will live. So Jairus sets out to find Jesus. And when he finds Jesus, listen, there are four things that explode out of this passage of Scripture with meaning and power for us who are gathered in this room today. Four things that stand up on tiptoes and demand to be noticed. I want to touch on these four things because I believe the Lord wants to speak these four things to us today and remind us from His Word that with Him, it's never too late. With Him, it's not all over yet. And the first thing I want you to see with me is this. I want you to see here the power of prayer. The power of prayer. When you look in verse 23 of this passage, the Bible tells us when Jairus finds Jesus, he came and notice what he does. He fell at his feet. One translation says he besought him greatly. Another says he begged Jesus earnestly. He says, my little daughter is at the point of death. One version says, I pray thee. I'm praying to you, Lord, if you will just come to my home. If you will just lay your hand on my little girl, she will be healed and she will live. Notice here, Jairus came recognizing who Jesus was. She came honoring him for the son of God that he was. He did not come boastfully. He did not come arrogantly. He didn't come trying to impress Jesus with who he was. You know, there's some people I've met, I didn't know how great they were until they told me. Oh, you've met some of those people too, haven't you? Kind of like the story of the woodpecker who was pecking on the big oak tree one day. Wasn't doing any damage, but he's hammering away with everything he's got. All of a sudden, a bolt of lightning hits that big oak tree, splits it right down the middle. The woodpecker flies off, comes back a few minutes later with five other woodpeckers and says, there it is, fellas. Look what I've done. I have split the mighty oak tree. Jairus had none of that in him. At this point, he was only interested in getting somebody to come by and raise his little girl up off that sick bed. And so he came humbly. He came sincerely. He came and he fell at the feet of Jesus. Not only was it a humble approach, it was a specific approach. He didn't flower it up. He didn't try to come in and impress Jesus with all of his jargon of religiosity. Oh no, he simply came in, fell at the feet of Jesus and told him the need he had in his life. I'm convinced of something, church. Too many times we get frustrated in our praying because we are too general and we're not specific enough. Let me illustrate this. If you go to the doctor, you're not going to just walk into the doctor's office and say, okay, doc, work on anything you want to. No, I'm not. I'm not. Typically, they will ask you, what is bothering you? What's going on? And you try to tell them specifically what's taking place inside of your body. If you go to the dentist, I don't know what it is about the dentist. When I go, I break into a sweat. My blood pressure goes through the roof. I, I just about have a, a nervous, as my mom used to say, a hissy fit. And I'll perspire. 
I don't know. But I'm not going to just say to the dentist, hey, pull any of them you want to. Do whatever you want to. Oh, no, no, no. I've got a specific problem. I need a specific response. If you've got a legal issue, you're not going to find a lawyer somewhere, go in and say, pull your law book off the shelf and work on any case you want to work on. Oh, no. You've got a specific problem or you wouldn't be there. And here's the point. If we get that specific with all of these other professions in our lives, how much more specific do we need to get with the Lord? At this moment, Jairus just wanted somebody who could come by with healing power and divine grace and raise his little girl up off of that sick bed. But let me tell you something. When we pray with this kind of humility, when we pray with this kind of desperation, when we pray with this kind of earnestness, we are going to touch the heart of God. And we can rest assured that He is able to supply all of our need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I'm just trying to tell you, if you're here this morning, and your world has been turned upside down. If you're here today and the bottom has fallen out and you're reaching up to touch that proverbial bottom, if you feel like you have nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn, you don't know how to figure it out, you can't comprehend what's going on in your world, I came by to remind you there is power in prayer. There is power when we call on the name of the Lord. Prayer is more than grace over meals. Prayer is more than getting up late in the morning, gulping down a cup of coffee, jumping in your automobile, heading to work, going through your day, getting home, eating something, falling in the bed, and going, thank you, Lord, for your help. Prayer's more than that. Sometimes we're like the little boy who prayed the now I lay me down to sleep prayer. You, you know that prayer, don't you? You've heard of that prayer. He prayed it so many times that he had it memorized. He could recite it by rote. In fact, on the wall beside his bed, his mom had bought him a plaque with that little prayer on it. One evening he came in, he was whipped, he was wore out. He fell into the bed and instead of praying that prayer, he said, Oh God, I'm so tired. You've heard me pray this prayer so many times. If you want to hear it, why don't you say... There it is. Just read it for yourself. I don't have it in me to pray that prayer. Hey, prayer is more than that. God, let me tell you what God wants this morning. You don't have to pray King James Version. You don't have to impress anybody in this room. You're not going to impress God. You don't have to worry about your grammar being correct and your diction being precise. You don't have to worry about all of that other stuff. All you've got to do is tell God what's going on right out of your heart. Because the Bible says if we'll draw nigh or near to God, He draws close to us. The Bible says if you'll ask, you can receive. If you'll seek, you will find. If you'll knock, then the Lord will start opening up doors. God simply right now wants to hear from your heart. If your world is in a mess, just tell Him about it. God, I'm in a mess. I need help that is higher than the heavens. I'm looking to you. I'm trusting in you. Please, God, come and rescue me. God understands that. And God will show up when people realize we have an avenue. And that avenue is the avenue of prayer. And that prayer will bring the very throne of God into your situation and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Hallelujah. Well, that's the power of prayer. 
There's a second truth I want you to see here. You're not going to like this. It's what I call the pain of reality. You got the power of prayer. You also got the pain of reality. Listen to this. Let's be honest. We get excited when we pray. And there seems to be a positive response to our prayer. I do. Jairus prayed. Verse 24 says, listen. Here's what he says. Jesus, I got to have you to come home with me. Lay your hands on my girl. She'll be healed. She'll live. Everything will be all right. The Bible says Jesus went with him. It seems right there an immediate answer to prayer. You ever had any of those times when you prayed and boom, there it is. Then there's other times you prayed six weeks, six months, six years, and you wonder if God's lost your name and your address. Jesus goes with him. No doubt Jairus thinks everything's going to be all right now. The Lord is going home with me. But while they're on their way, here it is. Here's the pain of reality. While they're on their way, someone meets them from the ruler of the synagogue's house and says, your daughter is dead. No need for you to trouble the master anymore. In other words, it's over. It's too late. Your daughter is dead. I read that and I'm thinking, wow. Wow. You talk about going from the heights of ecstasy, being encouraged to the depths of despair. There's a picture of it right here. In other words, even with Jesus going with us, there will be some tough times we've got to face. Now, I know you don't want to hear that. We, we want to say, oh, we want it to be all honey and no bees. We want it to be sweet and wonderful and glory and sugary. We want a Shekinah in and we want a glory out. We don't, we don't want to deal with that kind of stuff. There will be heartache you'll have to go through even with Jesus going with you. There will be pain that must be endured. Someone said, I don't see how people without Jesus make it with all of life's complexities and struggles. Let me tell you how some people try to make it. Are you ready? Some people pop the pills to try to make it, to numb out so they don't hurt as much. I'll tell you how some people try to make it. They get a needle and shoot a substance in their veins trying to escape. I'll tell you how some people try to make it. They climb up over a bridge and jump over the bridge. In fact, Rhonda and I were talking this morning. Just last week in the Tampa, Florida area, there was a bridge where so many people had jumped over ending it all. They had on the news, Pastor, where they had tried to build a fence to discourage people from jumping over the side of that bridge. It was on the news. I'll tell you how some people tried to cope. They tried to escape by, I'm just going to disappear. I'm going to run away from it all. I'm going to leave my responsibilities. I'm out of here. Not very successfully, I'm afraid. But that's the way some people try to cope. Now listen to me right now. Please hear me. You're going to have problems and challenges and difficulties whether you live for the Lord or not. Now we don't want to hear that, but that's the way life works. But in the middle of that, you can have a friend whose name is Jesus, who has promised He would never leave you. He would never forsake you. And Paul said in Romans chapter 8, hear this, the sufferings of this present time. In other words, whatever's going on right now, whatever you're dealing with right now, 
The sufferings of this present time, here it is, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Oh, that makes me want to say hallelujah. No matter how bad it is, you can flip the coin and realize in spite of what we go through, the suffering, the pain, the heartache, the disappointment, all that we encounter. Oh, there is glory that is waiting for those that will dare to trust in the Lord. Hey, listen, it may be bad, but it's not always going to be the way it is right right now. If you're going through a tough time, there is a glory road ahead that God has already paved. There are promises that God has already provided for those that will keep their eyes on Him and trust in His name and walk in His Spirit and overcome by His power. If you believe that, I wish somebody would clap your hands with me and rejoice in the Lord today. Now here's the deal. Jairus is no doubt at the peak of his faith. He received the word at that point that his daughter was dead. I mean, Jesus has responded to the prayer of Jairus. Did you notice this? Some of you Bible scholars that have read this story before. Jesus is walking to the home of Jairus while they are on their way, there's a little woman who has an issue of blood for 12 years. How old is his daughter? 12. Just thought I'd slip that in there. They're walking all of a sudden. This woman with an issue of blood reaches out a trembling, transparent hand, touches the garment of the Lord, and immediately she's healed. I'm sure Jairus' faith explodes. He knows everything's going to be all right. Then right after that, right after that, he gets the word, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Isn't that just like the devil? You can be rocking along, things going great, and the devil will come in and try to pull the rug out from under your feet. He'll try to explode his most extreme charge in your face to keep you from seeing the light of day. That would cause most people's faith to falter when the doctor walks in and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. We have about 130 acres on our campground down in Waimama, Florida. There's a lot of jokes about that that I won't even tread into. Somebody said, somebody drove through there and looked at their mom and said, why, Mama? <laughs> I mean, we've got about 130 acres there. We've got an event coming up this week. It's a historic place, a place where the miraculous has taken place. And listen, our campground director there for Lake Waimama Convention Center just recently found out his liver enzymes are up. He gets a bad report. Looks like it's cancer in the liver and in part of the pancreas and find a couple of spots on his lungs. Devastated. Devastated. They say it's inoperable. Without a miracle from God, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm just telling you, sometimes the pain of reality hits you right in the face and you feel so help helpless and the devil tries to make us feel hopeless. But I want to tell you we have a God who is greater than anything that ever rises against us. So when you pray, remember Jerry Mace. Call his name in prayer. Jerry Mace. He's a man of God. And he told us the other night, Rhonda and I dropped by their house. He said, Bishop, I just want to tell you something. I'm healed one way or the other. Either God's going to raise me up, I'll give him glory, or he's going to take me up, and I won't have any more suffering, no more pain. That is the pain of reality. But I need to move on because not only do we see the power of prayer and the pain of reality and some of you are right there in the pain of dealing with reality you know what it is you know what you're facing I'm just flowing right now some of you with family situations 
your children who have disappointed you. Some of you even disappointed with God. Why didn't God come through? Why didn't God move this way? Why did He choose to handle it another way? And you're dealing with the pain of reality. But the good news is this. The third thing, here it is. I'm going to talk about the possibilities of faith. The possibilities of faith. At this very point, get it? Here it is. Look at the chronology. Jesus is going home with him. He gets the word, Jairus, your daughter is dead. It's over. It's too late. When that happens, the Lord walking with him, I can almost see him turn to Jairus and say this, Be not afraid. Stop fearing. Here it is. Only believe. Yes. Only believe. You know, sometimes faith and believing God, we make it more difficult than it really is. He didn't say, only go to a seminar about faith and then believe. He, said, he didn't say, only listen to teaching about faith and then believe. He, hey, some people feel you got to have a super duper whooper whopper red hot evangelist come in, call you out, prophesy over you and tell you things they're not supposed to know about you in order for you to believe. You don't have to do that. The Lord can touch everybody in this room right now. If we will only believe, it is the least and the most that we can do. Now, can you imagine telling somebody who's just lost their daughter, don't worry about it. Only believe. Jesus does. That's what he does. And the literal meaning here is this. Stop fearing and just keep on believing. Here's what Jesus was saying, Jairus. When you came to me a little while ago, you presented your need for your daughter. You felt like if I'd come to your house, lay hands on her, she'd be healed, she'd live. You were believing then. Don't stop believing now. It's no time to stop believing now. Just keep on believing. Can I tell you when the clouds are the darkest, just keep on believing. When the storm is at its worst, keep on believing. When the attack is the most severe against you from the enemy of your soul, keep on believing. When you can only stand, just stand and keep on believing. When it looks like your boat is about to go under, that is not the time to jump ship and say, I'm out of here. You've got to keep on believing. When it looks like disease is going to destroy your body and take you out, that's not the time to let go of your faith. That's the time to hold on and trust God like you've never trusted God. Be not afraid. Just keep on believing. Because here's what you'll find. If he started going with you, he'll go with you all the way. If he's taken the first step, he has not backed out. He didn't teach us to swim to allow us to drown. He didn't build us up to let us be torn apart. The Bible says he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Let me tell you what that does. That opens up unlimited possibilities. We have unlimited possibilities today. That means in the time of discouragement, he's there to lift us up. In the time of disability, he's able to help us to stand and to walk. In the time of despair, he's here to give us a shot of divine encouragement. It means he is able, listen, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think according to his power that works in us. Possibility. She's dead. Jesus, now, 
Are you saying that even if she's dead, she can be brought back to life again? Jesus said, all I'm saying is keep on believing. Are you saying to us that these people don't know what they're talking about? All I'm saying is keep on believing. Jesus, are you saying the doctors have misdiagnosed it? Jesus said, all I'm saying is just keep on believing. Don't let your faith falter. Hold on to your hope and your faith in God. Listen, it doesn't matter what the outlook is. The outlook may be bleak, but the outlook is delightful. The outlook, it may be discouraging, but the outlook is filled with hope and victory. The outlook may be defeat, but the outlook is victory. There's all kinds of possibilities if we'll keep on believing. Do you, do you believe that? No matter how dire your circumstance looks right now, Jesus says, stop fearing. Just keep on believing. And here's the final thing that I'm going to pray with you. Here's the final thing. The presence of Christ. The presence of Christ. When Jesus walked into that house, the home of Jairus, does anybody know what was going on there? Do you know what they were doing? They were weeping. They were wailing. They were preparing for the time this little girl would be buried. And Jesus walks into this situation. I love Jesus. I love him. Nothing throws him. Nothing <coughs> discourages him. Nothing overwhelms him. They're in there weeping and wailing. Jesus walks up. And the King James puts it like this. Why make ye this ado? In other words, what's everybody upset over? What's going on here? Everything's going to be all right. I'm here now. I'm the resurrection and the life. Let me tell you something. When the resurrection and the life walks in, death has to walk out. When the resurrection and the life walks in, the enemy has to get out. And verse 39 says, here's what they said. He says, I'm here. And Jesus said, she's not dead. She's asleep. Do you know what they did? They laughed him to scorn, the Bible says. They ridiculed him. They made a joke out of it. And I love Jesus. You know what he does? He puts the laughers, the mockers, and the scoffers outside. <laughs> and he goes in, Peter, James, and John, Jairus, and his wife, and closes the door. I love Jesus because he put those outside that would be a hindrance, that would thwart faith. He gets them out of the room. They had to stand outside and not see what goes on on the inside. <laughs> and those on the outside, however, did not stop the Lord from working on the inside. You do know we live in post-Christian America, don't you? I'm not, I'm not trying to be an alarmist. It's just the way it is. There are people on the outside, they don't get it. They don't get it. They, they don't understand how we can rejoice and clap our hands with optimism. We know what's going to happen. We've got peace yes. in spite of all the turmoil. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and those outside that can mock us and make fun of us, they still can't stop Jesus from working on behalf of his people. Would you stand with me? Get this. 
Get this. Jesus, Jesus walks over to this little girl and he says, now I know if you read it, it would say Talitha Kumai, but that literally means this. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Anybody know what happened? Huh? She got up. Do you know why she got up? The resurrection of the life said, I say. When he says, I say, it doesn't matter what death says. When he says, I say, it doesn't matter what the doctors say. When he says, I say, it doesn't matter what the devil says. When he says, I say, it doesn't matter what the doubters say. When he says, I say, it doesn't matter what disease says. Because all power is given unto him, both in heaven and earth. When he says, I say, it happens because he has the power, he has the ability, he has the authority to turn things around and make a way when there seems to be no way. I want to stop here. I'd not plan to do this. Brother Drake, I don't know if you know this. My oldest son, when he was born, we were pastoring in Huntsville, Alabama. I was on Whitesburg Drive, the south part of Huntsville. Brother Al Bristow was at that time, Pulaski Pike, Pulaski Pike. Our son was born. They snatched him away. He had a rare form of pneumonia. His lungs collapsed and the patent ductus would not allow the blood to circulate through his body. And so we were told by the doctor, call all the family in, he's going to die. Get ready for a funeral. That's what we were told. Our family came in, they washed up, went in, saw Brock. I went, I went from the peak of joy to the pit of despair. I went to a hospital room that was empty. I fell between the bed and the wall. And I said, God, I got to have some help here. I don't know what to say, don't know how to pray. I don't I just need some help. I just need some assurance here. This is bigger than I am. I'm not one of these guys, Pastor, that opens the Bible, points to a verse, and I'm like, I'm claiming this verse. Yeah. Tears were streaming down my face, but I opened the Bible and I looked down. God is my witness. I looked down and the Word says, I'll turn your mourning into dancing. Yeah. Something happened inside of me. I can't explain it. Doesn't make sense till today. Only I know it was God. I knew that I knew that I knew everything's going to be all right. I got up. I went back to intensive care. Brock was in intensive care for 21 days. I walked in and the doctor there said, how are you doing? I said, everything's going to be all right. She said, oh, no, don't get your hopes up. He's worse than ever. He's not going to be with us long. I said, I can't explain it. I said, I hear you guys have a preemie party. And he wasn't a preemie, but after a year, they would show up with all the little babies and the news media would be there and everybody would show off their baby. And I said, in a year, I'll come back and say, this is what the Lord has done. She looked at me like I'd lost my mind. Let me tell you something. God started doing a work. We took him home from the hospital. We had started a church. They shut down twice before we got there. Nobody there. I had to push mo five acres 
with a lawnmower that wouldn't run when it got heated. Nobody there to preach to. Finally, a couple showed up. I stood there very calm and collected and talked one Sunday. They left. I called them the next morning. I said, we were so thrilled to have you at church. They said, we won't be back. <laughs> Why? You're too wild for us. I'm like, wild? I put myself to sleep. It was that bad. But I want to tell you, God started doing a work. Rhonda got ready to take him, to enroll him. I guess it was kindergarten, first grade. And they said, we'll put Brock over in the corner. Now, you don't know this woman. We'll put him in the corner and let him color. He, can't, he won't be able to learn like other kids because we've looked at the report. Rhonda said, oh, no, you won't. She grabbed him by the hand, took him out, and I followed. We found a Christian school with a teacher named Kuma Bryant. She had anoint Brock, agree with us. We prayed over him. He started growing. They said, all of this negative junk, let me just fast forward and tell you that Brock went to Lee University and graduated with honors. He went, he's got his master's degree, got it with honors. He's working on his doctorate right now. He'll do it with honors. I tell you, when Jesus shows up, he has a way of turning things around. There's some people in this room right now you're wondering, can it ever change? Will it ever take place? I came by to tell you the Lord has stepped into this room. He has heard your cry. He sees your heart. Yes. And He is able to do for us right now things that we can't even conceive in our minds because He's a great, big, wonderful God. If you believe that, would you clap your hands? I want you to do something. Anybody need a miracle here today? You need a miracle. You need for God to turn something around. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a financial dilemma. Maybe you've just been battling discouragement. Despair has tried to overwhelm you. Maybe your children are apart from the touch of the Lord, separated from Jesus. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to make it easy on you. I'd like everybody that's physically able to just make your way and stand here around this 